Since Israel has rejected a promised Messiah, the Jews have been cast aside forever, and their glorious promises have been given exclusively to the church. Thus, the church has replaced Israel. And so, I mean, you can really understand why people have embraced replacement theology when you think about, you know, we always think about, okay, well, Israel is now a nation, but for almost 2,000 years, I'm mean, 1,800 plus years, the nation of Israel did not exist. So you can imagine when, you know, growing up this third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth centuries, you read Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and there's no nation of Israel, and the Jews are scattered throughout the nations. You can understand how an allegorical method of interpreting the prophetic scriptures began to develop, and, you you know, it makes, it makes a a ton of sense why replacement theology was in place for for many many years centuries um, that led to anti-semitism which we looked at in that session but um, so it's understandable why why replacement theology has been grounded within the church but I you know now that Israel has has become a nation which is to me one of the greatest miracles uh, since the time of Jesus, that out of nowhere, God fulfilled his promise in 1948 and made it Israel nation again. It's just a dramatic uh, confirmation of prophetic scripture. And where it really pertains to us in this class is we're not going to be able to, to understand God's plan for the end of the age clearly until we understand the error of this belief system. And I, I mean, I'm charismatic. I know all of us are charismatic. So I think especially in the charismatic church is, you know, is there's a lot of replacement theology. And, and even though people might love Israel, when they come to some of the scriptures, they want to spiritualize them where it's actually written about Israel. And so anyway, until we understand the errors of this belief system, we're not going to be able to see God's plan for the end of the age clearly. So that's a, that's a really big deal. Uh, the other thing about it too is in Matthew 5, 17, you know, Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the prophets. And so everything the prophets spoke of, when, I, when he spoke of the prophets, that obviously the New Testament had not been written in, so he's talking of Isaiah, he's talking of Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Joel, Malachi. And so Jesus has not abolished the prophets, but the prophecies are actually about him and he fulfills them for Israel in a literal way, especially as we head towards his glorious return. So he has not abolished them. He has fulfilled them and will fulfill them in the days ahead. Um, you cannot understand properly the New Testament, and I, I'm seeing this all over the place in the charismatic church especially, but you cannot understand Matthew 24. You cannot understand first and second Thessalonians, you cannot understand the book of Revelation until you understand the, the Old Testament prophets, especially Daniel. Daniel's huge. And so, you know, and we'll look at this in a minute, but Daniel is, is just repeated often in the book of Revelation. Joel's repeated in the book of Revelation. Isaiah's repeated in the book of Revelation. Ezekiel is in the book of Revelation. And so, until you, until you really understand that the, that the church has not replaced Israel. We've been grafted into Israel. It just opens up this massive door of confusion when it comes to the end times. And, you know, in all reality, the, the end times might seem confusing, but it's really pretty simple. I think the reason, so much of the reason for the confusion in the church about the end times is because we have removed Israel out of the equation through replacement theology. And because of this now, um, because of that, then so many, it opens the door to so many misinterpretations, so many, just so much confusion. So very, very important when it comes to, to understanding the end times is, is the church has not replaced Israel. We have been grafted into Israel. Uh, this brings us now to session six and to Daniel's 70 week prophecy. Um, this is another very important statement here is, is, uh, God, ha as, as it comes to the book of Daniel, if you want to understand the book of Daniel, and to me, it, it, it can be confusing with all these different things going on, all these different visions and dreams. It really does come down to this passage of scripture, Daniel 24 through 27. God has a sixfold purpose for the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. So, this, this purpose, and you know, we went through it in the teaching, but that purpose is accomplished during a timetable, a divine timetable 
of 490 years. And so this purpose is also executed by four worldwide empires, which God has used and will use to refine, purify, purge, prepare, and judge Israel and the Jewish people. So, so he's using four worldwide, worldwide empires to prepare Israel for all that he has in store. Um, now, a lot of people go, well, if it's not about me, I don't really care about understanding it. And that's not true. Daniel's prophecy not only relates to Israel, but it's like a, the epicenter of an earthquake. It just, it just flows out of Israel, too, and it will dramatically affect every nation who lives at the end of the age. So this prophecy is also what, what some scholars refer to as the backbone of end-time prophecy. I mean, we see it, in, we see it in, in Matthew 24 when Jesus talked about the abomination of desolation. We see it in 2 Thessalonians when Paul said that the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, will sit in the temple of God. Well, that's coming straight from the book of Daniel. We see it in uh, Revelation 11, 11 through four, 1 through 14, where the, the, the uh, two witnesses are prophesying. We see it in Revelation 12. We see it in Revelation 13, Revelation 17 and 18. So that this book of Daniel is, is vital, uh, is a vital uh, passage or vital chapter uh, or book of prophecy we need to understand. Now, we, this is what we went through. I won't go through the details of this, but um, I definitely, when, when I taught this at church, it definitely gave the whole deer in the headlight look when I went through the whole map of this, but it's really profound when you think about it is Artaxerxes gave a command to rebuild Jerusalem in 444 BC. And that was the beginning of this prophecy, which in, in the yellow here, we have seven weeks plus 62 weeks. That gives us 69 weeks. So from the, com the time the, com the command was given to rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. And um, I mentioned that book in the uh, teaching where he went through and he talked about how that actually came to the time period where the triumphal entry of Jesus in March 30th, 33 AD. And we went through the math, how that all relates. And you, you can see that those, uh, that time period fulfilled uh, perfectly. It's, it's pretty stunning to see how God has already fulfilled prophecy. And we know then if, if God fulfilled it in this way, literally, and with such dramatic accuracy, then he's going to do it again in the future. So the future fulfillment of Daniel 9.27 is when, when Daniel said, on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate. This is synonymous with the abomination of desolation that Jesus spoke about in Matthew 24, and Matthew gave us that apostolic command, let the reader understand. And you know, I'm, sadly today in the church, not a lot of people, well, I mean, I'm going to say a lot of people, uh, there is a growing number of people that are unfamiliar with the connection between Matthew 24 and Daniel 9 through 927 and the future fulfillment of that. And, you know, we talked about that in an earlier session that gives rise to the preterist teaching or partial preterist teaching. And uh, it's, it's clearly that prophecy has not been fulfilled. It's clearly a prophecy that's coming in the future. And it looks like as we live, things are moving so fast that we might see that in our lifetimes. Um, so still talking about the future fulfillment of Daniel 927 is the abomination of desolation is, is when the Antichrist goes into the temple that the Jewish people are going to rebuild uh, he's going to stop the sacrifices, which he actually enables in the covenant he makes. And when he does that, he sets up the abomination of desolation, where he himself goes into that temple and restarts, begins to receive the worship as God. It's the catalyst for the great tribulation, uh, the last three and a half years of the age. Uh, the Antichrist is the one who's going to make a firm covenant with many people, including the Jews and the Arabs. And this seven-year peace treaty is going to allow Israel to resume their Levitical sacrificial system that the Torah uh, prescribes. And so um, the reason, even, even Daniel's 70th week, the, the reason scholars talk about it being the backbone of end time prophecy is you look at these, these scripture references here in, in the book of Revelation is Daniel is repeated here in, uh, in that, that, that time period, the Daniel 70th week is, is mentioned in the 40. These are not just random numbers that God just throws out. 42 months, 1,260 days. That doesn't even make sense. Why? Well, it makes perfect sense. It's actually 
referring right back to Daniel 9, 24 through 27 of that uh, three and a half year time period that marks the great tribulation, the 42 months, the 1,260 days, a time, times, a half a time is symbolic of a year, two years, and a half a year. And so it's, it's a direct reference to Daniel 70th, 70th week. Um, and it is related to th this, the thing that's really important to walk away from this teaching is this is related to the Jewish people living in the land of Israel. It's related to the Jewish people occupying the city of Jerusalem and performing the temple sacrifices. And so sometimes, sometimes you'll, you'll come across books or teachings or scholars or videos or whatever, and they'll say, well, there's an 1800 plus year gap. That obviously can't mean it's gonna be fulfilled in the future. And those who say that really are lacking understanding of what the entire thing is all about. It is about the Jewish people in Israel, occupying Jerusalem, performing temple sacrifices. And because they were out of the land for 1800 plus years, then that, put, that prophecy was put on pause. And now that is, the Jewish people have come back to Israel in 1948, now that uh, the Jews have uh, captured Jerusalem in 1967, the only thing that is remaining for that Daniel 70th week to begin to begin to unfold is the, res the resumption of temple sacrifices. So that explains that pause. It's real simple. I mean, you know, you, you're, you're probably going to, you, you, you may have heard that before, but I run into that sometimes and it's just like, they think they're so smart and they're like, well, if there's 1800 plus years, then obviously this is nonsense to think it's going to happen in the future. And, and it was really simple. So it's really simple. Um, now moving into session seven and the four empires. And again, if you have questions as I'm going through this, just jot them down and we'll have some time uh, at the end to go through the questions here and, dis and have discussion. Um, but the four empires revealed by Daniel in session seven, just as a review here is, is Daniel two and Daniel seven. I, I mean, we're, I'm sure we're all familiar with Daniel's dream, which is one of the most dramatic I think one of the most dramatic miracles in scripture, if you think about how crazy dreams are, is you're, here he is threatened with his life on the line. And uh, Daniel, Daniel not only gets the interpretation, he actually sees the very dream Nebuchadnezzar had. And so that in itself is a miracle. But uh, the, it, it's, it's really clear that the, the Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 are basically the very same message, just stated in a different way. Sometimes you'll come into some, some prophecy teaching, especially some of these guys on TV, and they'll say, well, no, the lion is actually uh, symbolic of the U United Kingdom and America mer merging together and the humbling of America and England. I'm not saying we won't have a, a humbling. We certainly are on the way to that right now. But the bear is Russia. The leopard is Germany. Um, but I don't think that's what, I don't think that's accurate. I, I think it's very clear. It's very simple. God is just repeating the message he had in Daniel 2 and in Daniel 7 by a, a different symbolism of lion, bear, leopard, and iron monster. So um, what we know is, and what we went through in the notes is, you know, Babylon is the gold and the lion. Media Persia or the Persian empire is the silver and the bear. Greece is the bronze and the leopard. And Rome is the iron and the iron monster. And I went through, and then I won't repeat it here, but I went through in the notes and teaching why I do believe the fourth is uh, Rome. Um, and so anyway, I'm not going to go into that here, but uh, just important to understand those things. Um, this, is, this is, for me, the key to interpreting those empires is these empires are directly related to Daniel 9, 24 through 27. That is the Jewish people living in Israel, uh, occupying the city of Jerusalem and performing temple sacrifices. And so we, we have example, here's, you know, we see it very clearly. Babylon attacked Jerusalem. They took Jew, the Jews captive. They destroyed the temple. Um, Media Persia permitted Jerusalem to be rebuilt. They allowed the Jews to return to Judea and they authorized the reconstruction of the temple. Then Greece, through Antiochus Epiphanes, invaded Jerusalem, persecuted the Jews, and defiled the temple with an abomination. And then number four, Rome attacked Jerusalem, killed over a million Jews, and they burned the temple to the ground. So anyway, I think you see those four empires, really, there's a, there's a very common pattern with those four empires that show us, okay, these are 
uh, indeed the four empires that Daniel spoke about in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. And so, you know, just one example, um, there, there's, a, there's a new, uh, that some have begun to teach that the fourth kingdom in Daniel 2, in Dan, the fourth empire in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 is the Ottoman Empire and, uh, or, or the British Empire, or, but especially the Ottoman Empire. And, and the reason I don't think it's the Ottoman Empire, there's, there's several reasons, but when we come to Daniel 9, 24 to 27, the Ottoman Empire conquered Jerusalem when the Jews were not living in Israel. They, they defeated the Roman Empire um, and, and what was remaining of the Roman Empire, and eventually they, they took over Jerusalem. And uh, so they ruled Jerusalem when the Jews were not, I mean, there was obviously some Jews, but, but most, the majority of the Jewish people had been scattered to the nations. So that, um, that prophecy for, or in terms of the Ottoman empire, they, they definitely did, definitely does not relate to them, uh, does not relate to the time when Israel, the Jewish people were in the land, the Jewish people occupied Jerusalem and they were performing temple sacrifices. So Anyway, that's that's just one point of clarification. I, I think it's important to, as we as we talk about the uh, these empires, is to see them on a map. It's really really helpful because, as we're going to see in a minute, is in Revelation 13, the Antichrist is described as a lion, a bear, and a leopard, and I think that tells us the territory the Antichrist is going to um, uh, have sovereign permission by God to have authority over. Sometimes we think the anti, and I, I grew up Southern Baptist and, you know, grown up Southern Baptist, you, I, I remember, you know, I remember, I don't know, I was in middle school and they showed, or maybe high school, and they showed us this video of like people getting their heads chopped off. I mean, just horrible things <laughs> happening about the end times. And it was just, this message communicated that the Antichrist is going to have absolute dominion over every single nation on the earth and there's no escape from him. And um, I don't think that's true. I think it's just going to be a, a, a specific land territory, mainly from Europe to the Middle East that the Antichrist, God will sovereignly give the Antichrist dominion over. But that doesn't mean he won't have influence on all the nations. He will, but um, that the place where he puts his foot down and conquers is in the, is in uh, the Europe, to the Middle East. And so he's seeing it on a map really helps. So the Lion Kingdom, the Gold Kingdom is from about Egypt, the, the border of Egypt all the way into Iraq here in, the, in this pink. Then the, uh, the green here is the Persian Empire, which you can see it's expanded significantly. And it goes all the way up here into to Macedonia and Turkey and Egypt, all the way through into Iran and India, all the way throughout the Middle East. Um, and then the Greece Empire, Greek Empire through Alexander the Great. If, if you look here, basically it's the exact same territory. The only the only addition here is in, is this part of Greece, and so it's basically the exact same thing as the Persian Empire. And then then you have the division. You know, remember Daniel saw the the four heads of the leopard, and it was symbolic of the division of Alexander's empire and the separation into four different divisions. And so you have these four different divisions here. Um, and it was through the, the blue, the Seleucid Empire, where Antiochus Epiphanes, um, or, or no, no, it was actually the green, through which Antiochus Epiphanes came out of and attacked Israel. So anyway, that's the division of the, the four empires there. And then this is the Roman Empire, which you see it goes, this is in 117 AD, which goes from Spain all the way, you know, parts of Egypt all the way through uh, the Middle East, all the way into uh, parts of Iraq. And so anyway, you kind of get, an, you kind of, this helps you get an idea of, um, of the territory the Antichrist is going to have dominion over, where he's going to conquer. Um, and there'll be, and we'll, we'll talk about this in a minute, but there'll be war until the end, and the Antichrist will be waging war, in specifically in this area. And that doesn't mean it's not going to be other nations that we don't see on these maps, but it'll be specifically targeted in this area where he's going to uh, try to establish his base and his kingdom. And, and the, the other thing too, just to mention, is sometimes, you know, I don't want us to get lost in all the details. Okay, why, why is this important? But um, as forerunners, it's important to know as forerunners that one of the things for a forerunner, and whether you are, whether you have influence over thousands, whether you have influence over five, 
or just your family or just friends is there are there are just masses massive number of people that don't have understanding of the times we live in the things that are happening biblical prophecy being unfolded um, giving insight and understanding to the many is one of the one of the tasks and the mandates of a forerunner is God wants to raise up messengers who will give understanding to the many. Um, in fact, in Matthew 24, when Jesus was talking about the days of Noah, um, one of the things that's really sobering is, is the days, in the days of Noah, the people did not understand until Noah and his family entered the ark, and then the flood came. And the majority of the nations are not going to understand. They have no clue what's, what's happening right now. But much of the church doesn't have a clue of what's happening right now. And that's why forerunners need to be equipped to, with the knowledge and the understanding and the insight to be a messenger to, to call the church out of uh, complacency and apathy and be equipped knowing these, these different, uh, how prophecy is being fulfilled. So that's, that's important to make a note of. Um, the other thing too is when you read Daniel 7, 17 through 23, it's, it's real, this is actually really, really important even when you come into Revelation 17, when, when John is revealed the, the seven heads on the beast or seven kings, is it, if you notice very carefully, and I, I highlighted it in the notes, is kings and kingdoms are used interchangeably in the book of Daniel. So you might say, one time they might say the fourth king, then they might say the, the kingdom. And so they use them interchangeably. And uh, that, that's really important when we come into Revelation and interpret Revelation 17, is they're, they're used interchangeably there. Um, and, and so the, the, one, of the, one of the questions that people obviously ask is, okay, why do you think there has to be a revived Roman Empire or some kind of revival of the Roman Empire? Why do we think that has to happen? Well, the first one is Daniel 7:24 shows us that out of this kingdom, the Iron Kingdom, out of this kingdom, 10 kings are going to arise. Uh, that did not happen in the ancient Roman Empire. So we know, okay, well, if it didn't happen, then there's got to be some type of revival of that ancient empire. The second thing we have to know is um, Daniel saw the iron mixed with clay. And that iron mixed with clay comes out of the iron kingdom. And so anyway, the, you know, that definitely didn't happen, that iron mix of clay. So we know there has to be some type of revival of that iron kingdom, some type of revived Roman Empire. Uh, the third thing is when Jesus comes back, if you read carefully in Daniel chapter 2, he strikes the toes of iron and clay at his return. It's the very same thing as him striking and waging. The, Revelation 17 describes us. He's going to, the ten kings and the Antichrist are going to wage war against him. Daniel 2 and Revelation 17 are saying the very same thing. So Jesus at his return is going to defeat the, the ten toes of iron and clay at his return, telling us that there needs to be some type of a revival because that wasn't fulfilled. Um, it hasn't been fulfilled yet. And then finally, uh, Revelation 17 and 18 shows the revived Roman Empire where the, the great city, the harlot city, is the city of Rome. And, uh, and so, you know, that obviously is showing us Rome being revived. Okay, so now we come to this summary here where we have the, the first, this is the, these are the eight kingdoms right here that are revealed in Revelation 17, 9 through 11. And we went through this in our notes, but these are the eight kingdoms that are revealed in Revelation 17. Um, Daniel doesn't mention the first two, but he does mention from three to eight. And so, anyway, you can kind of see how those all correspond. The, um, the seventh kingdom is a revived Roman empire of iron and clay, and it's in the iron monster. The eighth kingdom is the Antichrist kingdom, the Antichrist empire of iron and clay and the iron monster. Um, but when we come to really a, a big question people have is, okay, okay, there is a seventh and there is an eighth kingdom. Okay, who then is the seventh kingdom? Some have said, like I said, some have said it's the Ottoman Empire. Others have said it's the British Empire. Some have even said it's under Nazi Germany with Hitler. Um, but so I, I believe that it's, that there's two criteria for identifying who exactly is the seventh kingdom and what will that look like. 
Uh, the first one is we see very clearly in Revelation 17, 10, is that seventh kingdom has to be in power for a short time. And when you think about the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Empire was in place for like 500 years, maybe something like that, four or 500 years. So that is definitely not a short time. And so I think the, sh the, the short time is going to be in comparison to the other five or the other six kingdoms that preceded it. So anyway, I think we can, you, through that, it's a criteria we can look at. Um, the, the next thing is we know, given that the connection with Daniel's 70 week prophecy, there is a strong correlation between Daniel's 70 week prophecy and um, the seventh kingdom. So and so anyway, the, at the apex of power, the seventh kingdom is going to rise to its apex of power when the Jewish people are in Israel, they occupy Jerusalem, and they perform sacrifices in the temple. And so for those reasons, I don't believe it's the Ottoman Empire or the British Empire. So I think it's actually a future kingdom. So we haven't, I mean, I think it's actually rising up as we speak. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But it's taken to, pre to preeminence by the Antichrist. And the seventh kingdom is going to be the kingdom in power when the Antichrist signs the seven-year peace treaty with Israel that we see in Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Um, the, the other thing that's very important to understand is the Antichrist is both the seventh king of the seventh empire and the eighth king of the eighth empire. Now, the, 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 the seventh kingdom is, going to, is rising up in our day, and there will, there will be other leaders and other influential people, but this, the Antichrist will be the ultimate, the ultimate king of that empire. And that'll have, that hasn't happened yet, but it's, you know, it seems like we're moving in that direction pretty quick. Um, for me, the, the, my eyes were so opened when, um, I don't know, I, I believe the Lord revealed to me, um, it just, just studying Revelation 17, ancient, just, just the mystery that it is. I, I just believe that, uh, I do believe the, that Revelation 17 and 18, which are two chapters in this prophecy, telling us that this is very important, is the seventh kingdom is revealed in Revelation 17 and 18. So I think when you read Revelation 17 and 18, if you look at it as, okay, this is describing the seventh kingdom, it makes so much more sense. It just solves so much of the mystery to it. Um, the other thing is we saw is Rome is, is clearly meets all the five criteria that we laid out. It needs to be um, a real city. That means Revelation 17, 18 isn't only describing the apostate church. It's a real city. Um, it's located close to the ocean so that the people in their boats could see it burning. Um, it is a city that exports false religion to the nations. It's a city of renown because everyone, when, when, the, when the harlot city is burning, is just in total mourning over what happens. And then um, the fifth one, which is very, very important that I don't think we've, a lot of people have thought about, is Rome is responsible for the blood, the bloodshed of, of I don't know the numbers, but countless numbers of Christians, including the apostles and Jesus. And so if you read Revelation 19, the beginning of Revelation 19, it says, Rejoice, O heaven, for God has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. And so if you think about it, the patience of the Lord, that he has not yet judged Rome for the blood shed by the Roman Empire of Christ, the apostles, the, the, the persecution that came through Nero and Domitian, um, the you know, the Christians being thrown to the lions and the Colosseum, you know, God has not yet avenged that blood, but he's going to. <laughs> he is absolutely going to avenge the blood of his bondservants, of his prophets, of his saints, of his apostles, and of, of his son. And then we'll see that at the end of the age. So anyway, Rome meets all five criteria, um, and it also fits that, criteria, that requirement of a revived Roman Empire. Okay. So session eight here in the final empire, the main things we need to take away session eight is this is just kind of a recapping of that statue. The, the head of gold is Babylon. The breast of silver is Persia. Thighs of brass are Greece. The legs of iron are Rome. The uh, feet of iron and clay are, are a revived Roman empire. 
And then the toes of iron and clay are the Antichrist empire, the eighth kingdom. Um, this is, this came to me just on Thursday, but um, I think it really helps us understand that di there's a, there's a real big difference between the seventh and the eighth kingdoms. I think the seventh kingdom is the good side of the tree of the knowledge, while the eighth kingdom is the evil side of the tree of knowledge. And they're, they're both coming from the very same tree. In fact, you know, when Jesus talked about the harvest is the end of the age, the, the wheat and the tares are maturing together. And so the seeds sown in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the seventh and eighth kingdom, are going to reach their maturity at the end of the age through two antichrist kingdoms. The seventh kingdom is the good side of the tree of knowledge. The eighth kingdom is the evil side of the tree of knowledge. And uh, this chart here, this is in our notes, but this is, this is really important to understand because I, and I, and I'm sure you've probably heard for years about the antichrist, but you know, I think we don't, a lot of times when the Antichrist and all that's coming is taught, there's not a clear distinction between the two different kingdoms. And they're very, very different. Um, but they're both Antichrist. Um, and I, but I think we need to understand the differences here. So uh, the duration is the seventh kingdom. I put here five to 20 years. It's actually in my opinion, I need to change this in my notes, but it's actually a little bit longer than that because I believe the, the seventh kingdom began to be revived in about 1950 when the European Union began to form. And, and so, you know, we, we're into what's been, it's at the beginning of, beginning of restoration for about 70 years or whatever, but it was definitely accelerating. So, you know, you're looking at 70, 80, 100 years of, of but you know, it hasn't really come into maturity yet, but it, it's going to, and it's gonna be a short time. The eighth kingdom is only gonna be in place for three and a half years. Um, the, you know, so the, uh, the religion, the religion's very different. Uh, the religion in the seventh kingdom, I, I believe this is gonna be a universalism, uh, a merging of the three face of Abraham, a merging of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. In fact, the Pope is, is actively promoting this, even as, we, even as we speak, he's in Iraq right now, um, saying that the, the face of Abraham need to unite. Um, he's pushing universalism, but you can just get the idea, and we'll show a video here in a minute of this one world religion, the three face of Abraham, uh, merging together in this, you know, this, this, uh, what, what this harmonious coexistence where we all worship the same God in our own way, but the Antichrist religion will be very different. It's going to be absolutely totalitarian. It's going to be you either submit to this religion or you're going to die. It's going to be, you know, this is, there is no other religion that's going to be tolerated except the Antichrist and his religion. Uh, the government is also very different. So uh, this, this government of the seventh kingdom is going to be some type of a blend of socialism, corporatism, where you merge big business together with uh, government and religion. Uh, and we'll, we'll, when we see a video here, you'll, you'll make more sense. But, um, and also a technocracy. Um, the technocracy is, a lot of people haven't heard that word, but technocracy, what it is, is a form of government where the technical experts have reign. Uh, we, we're seeing that with big tech. We're seeing that with big corporations. We're seeing that with people like Dr. Fauci, who is the technical expert on what all things pertaining to health and whatever he says is the rule of the day. And so this type of government is going to be some type of technocracy where the elite, the technical elite who have the knowledge, who have the money, who have the resources are going to begin to lay down what the rules of the day are and what the legislation is. Um, and they're going to be the ones saying this is acceptable or not acceptable. Um, Whereas the, the Antichrist, when he comes to power, it'll be a complete dictatorship. He's the only one that's going to have the say. Um, it's not going to be this unity movement. It's going to be completely a dictatorship. Um, the economy is also different. And, and we're, we'll show a video here of inclusive capitalism. Is There's a move right now through the Great Reset trying to change capitalism as we know it. It's kind of a blending together of socialism and capitalism, which they call inclusive capitalism, to, to help 
it sounds great, but we know exactly what it is. It's, it's, it's socialism, which never ends well. But where we take the money and capitalism has been great to make a lot of people rich, but it, there's a lot of people who don't benefit from that and they want to spread the wealth, which it sounds great. But again, we know where socialism, where socialism always leads. But the economy of the Antichrist, the Eighth Kingdom, will be completely different. It will be a mark of the beast. The only way you're going to be able to buy or sell is if you take a mark that gives you that is basically, a, it's almost like a covenant mark that is pledging your allegiance to the Antichrist and his worship. And that mark is what's going to give you the ability to buy or sell. So the mark of the beast is not a vaccine. So it is actually the pledge of allegiance to the Antichrist. And it's going to be only if you have that pledge, can you buy or sell. Um, Satan's goal in the seventh kingdom is to prepare the nations to worship the Antichrist. And that's a big, that's a big thing to understand because if you think about it, the nations right now are not ready to worship one man. You know, we got Jews who were, who were not ready. We got Muslims who were not ready. We got Christians who were not ready. We got so many people that with, if the Antichrist was going to come onto the scene and say, worship me, so many people would say, forget about it. So Satan's goal is to make the nations drunk with false religion. He's, his goal is to make the nations intoxicated through an adulterous version of universalism. All, you know, the three face of Abraham, we worship the same God. We want, he's going, he wants to make the nations drunk through this false wine and that, through that, is going to uh, prepare the nations to worship the Antichrist. And so um, we see this, and we see the seventh kingdom in Revelation 17 and 18, and we see the eighth kingdom in Revelation 13. Um, we see the response. Let me make one note about this, because this, this is a question that um, was asked in one of the previous sessions that brought some confusion is, is the question was, okay, if the seventh kingdom comes before the eighth kingdom, but revelation 17 and 18 comes after revelation 13, how does that make sense? And that was a great question because a lot of people think the book of revelation is a book written in chronological order. Um, and there is some, that is in chronological order, but there's also parenthetical sections that are not in chronological order. And both, Revelate, in my opinion, Revelation 17 and 18 and Revelation 13 are, are both two separate parenthetical sections that are, don't flow in chronological order. Um, if we have time at the end, I can review the uh, structure of the book of Revelation and how I, how I read it and, 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 and shows the difference between parenthetical and chronological and how it flows. Um, so that, that was a great question. So that, that, that's my answer to that is, is, is the book of Revelation is not strictly written in chronological order. Some is, but some isn't. Um, Revelation 17 and 18, Revelation 13 are not uh, passages that are in chronological order. And so understanding that makes things a lot more uh, simple to understand. Um, the, the other thing is to think about is the seventh kingdom is going to be a false unity movement where the nations are going to have unity and alignment with this seventh kingdom. It's going to be the rebuilding of Babel is the nations together are going to say, we want to, we want to let us join together and build together a name, a tower, which will reach unto heaven. It is the, the tower Babel being rebuilt, ultimately coming into end time Babylon. So, there is, this is, this seventh kingdom is going to be built by a false unity movement. That's really important because we're seeing that right now is where we are seeing that right now. And uh, it's going to happen. It's going to come even, even more so in the days ahead, but the eighth kingdom, the response for the nations is going to be resistance and war. If you think about it, why is the Antichrist a, a warrior? Why is he so often portrayed as the one who's conquering, going forth, conquering to conquer is because the nations are not going to com want to comply with his dictatorship and his forced religion and forced economy. So the nations are going to resist the Antichrist and he's, his only option is to make war with them. So it's very different. I, I think understanding this here, spend some time thinking about this because this really um, makes 
these two things, these two kingdoms make so much more sense because sometimes when they're blended together, it's confusing. But when you break them apart like this, it go, okay, you can see, okay, there's a difference. There's definitely a difference. Um, we also went through um, the different phases of Daniel's of uh, Daniel 7, 24, where phase one, the Roman Empire is revived. Um, and I, I always like to know, okay, where exactly are we? Is you are here. This is, we're kind of in between the phase one and phase two. The, the 10 kings have not yet risen up, um, but they will. We're, we're, I, I think through the uh, UN's 2030 agenda, the Great Reset, inclusive capitalism, things like that, is this is going to accelerate the seventh kingdom to, to where 10 kings rise up, then the Antichrist rises up, then the Antichrist and 10 kings come to power, and uh, then we have the eighth kingdom with the great tribulation, three and a half years, and then the uh, subduing of three kings. Um, and so I mentioned that phase one, I think, has already begun in 1950, is now you have the European Union. I look at the, the revived Roman Empire as being this merger of the Iron Kingdom, the Roman, the, it's almost like a European and Arab alliance that, that I believe this will, will mark the seventh kingdom. That's what I believe the iron and the clay is ultimately symbolizing as a European Arab alliance. Um, and you're seeing it right now with Pope Francis going throughout the Middle East and, and wanting to unite together the, the Muslim Brotherhood and, and bring it all into one religion. But you see here, the, the European Union, this is the beginning, you know, this is probably about one third of the territory of the revived Roman Empire. Um, and, and you see that it's, it's um, obviously increasing. Well, I would say increasing. UK has left, but it's, you, you see it in place, you see it growing. One of the things that was, that was super interesting to me is we went to um, we went to Germany in 2017, and what really stood out to me is I, I don't say I don't over exaggerate this, but several times I saw this this woman on a beast, and I'm like that reminds me of Revelation 17 and 18. I was like, why do I keep seeing this? You know, I saw it. I saw it at this small church we went to in Germany. Then we went to Strasbourg, France, where the European Union is one of the um, I think the parliament, the EU parliament is in Strasbourg, France. And outside that building was this a different form of this very same statue. There's this, the same statue or a similar statue outside of Brussels in Belgium where the European Union is. And I was like, what is that? And it's actually the goddess Roma or the goddess, sorry, the goddess Europa. And it's interesting that one of the, the it's one of the symbols of the European Union is the woman riding the beast. Um, which correlates with Revelation 17 and 18. It's pretty interesting uh, when you see that. Um, when we go through uh, phase one of the revived Roman Empire is you have, I think through the UN 17 goals of sustainable development, the 2030 agenda, the World Economic Forum's Great Reset, I think that, the, you know, the, that territory we see in, you know, the European Union is going to grow and expand I think ultimately we'll see it go from Spain into Iraq throughout the Middle East. Um, another thing about this is in phase two is this, this, this actually came to me while I was writing is that the 10 Kings don't have governing authority until the Antichrist crowns them rulers in Revelation 13 1. And that's the start of the eighth kingdom. And that, that really makes uh, so much sense. So, what that means is you'll hear this in prophecy teachings is the 10 Kings are European nations or Islamic nations or 10 superpower nations. But I think this tells us, no, the 10 Kings, they rise up in international prominence, but they don't have dominion. They are not nations. They are not, um, they are not 10 EU nations. They are not presidents in place. They don't have dominion until the eighth kingdom until revelation 13, one, when the Antichrist crowns them as kings in his empire. Uh, phase three, the Antichrist is gonna carry the harlot city Rome to global prominence and Rome could very likely be the headquarters of the seventh kingdom. The Antichrist is gonna be used to fully revive the ancient Roman empire. I think again, it's gonna be a reviving that's gonna be more of an alliance between Roman, European and Arab alliance. Um, 
I think this uh, Roman Empire could likely be revived in reverse, you know, whereas the first century, or not the first century, the ancient Roman Empire um, flowed out of Rome to, to conquer the nations. This is more kind of going in reverse, where the EU is established, and then the 2030 Agenda, then the Ten Kings rise up, the Antichrist rises up, and then Rome becomes that headquarter city, like we see in Revelation 17. Um, phase four, the Antichrist and Ten Kings. The Antichrist is going to destroy the seventh kingdom instead of the eighth kingdom. And one, one of our students asked a great question, because I just, I just said it without even explaining it. Uh, she asked, okay, why will the Antichrist destroy harlot, the harlot uh, three and a half years before Christ returns? How do you know it's three and a half years? Well, I think, I think to, to understand that is you got to understand why the beast is going to hate the harlot, like it says in Revelation 17, 16. If, in fact, the harlot is going to be a one-world religion, a universal religion of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, that is going to deflect from what the Antichrist wants most, and that is unrivaled worship. So he wants worship without a rival. And so the harlot city is going to be the Antichrist major rival. And so we see in Revelation 13 that the Antichrist is worshiped for 42 months or three and a half years. So when you read that, you don't really get the picture of there's a rival. You get the picture of the Antichrist be, uh, him alone being worshipped by the unsaved, those unsaved in the nation. So that's why I think, that's why I think the the, the Antichrist and the uh, Ten Kings destroy Harlot Babylon at the beginning of the uh, at the end of the the first three and a half years, at the beginning of the last three and a half years. And what what's interesting is if you read in Revelation 17, 18, it says, uh, Rejoice, O heaven, and you prophets and bondservants and apostles, because God has judged your judgment on her. Well, how does God answer the, the prayers of the saints against harlot Babylon at the end of the age? He answers that prayer through the Antichrist and ten kings burning down Rome. So, you don't think God uses evil, read that chapter. He, he certainly does. He's going to use the Antichrist to bring judgment on the harlot. It's interesting. Um, Revelation 17, 11 says the, the beast is also an eighth and is out of seven. I know when, when I saw this for the first time, I was like, oh my goodness, this is what, this is, this makes so much sense is the eighth kingdom comes out of seven. So the seventh kingdom's established, and then out of that seventh kingdom comes the eighth kingdom. Um, and that's what that word means in the Greek, ek. It says uh, that the seventh is out of, or the eighth is out of seven. Um, then I think one very important thing to see here as well, Revelation 13, 2, is the Antichrist is described as a leopard, which is the Greek empire. He's described as a bear, the Persian empire. And he's described as a lion, the Babylonian empire. And so we know that for certain, the Antichrist, his kingdom will, will conquer that area of the Greek, Persian, Babylonian Empire, which if we put that together, it goes at least from Greece all the way into Iran. I think also then when you come to Daniel 2.35, is Jesus is going, when he strikes the statue on the toes, um, he's going, and that's the Ten Kings, when he wages war with the Ten Kings, when he comes back, at that very time, he's also going to crush the gold, the silver, the bronze, and the iron, which is going to be the same area of Rome, Greece, Persia, and Babylon. That means, in my opinion, that the, the territory the Antichrist and Ten Kings have dominion over and conquer will be from the territory of the Roman Empire to the, uh, all the way from like Spain into Iran. That, that territory is where we're gonna see the Antichrist and his Eighth Kingdom um, established. I think the other thing that's very important 
is Daniel 2.43, is it talks about the iron mixed with clay. And that word mixed in the Aramaic is the me is actually the word Arab and is used in uh I, I listed in the notes is used in uh, passages of scripture to show the the mixing of people which has become to be known as the Arabs. So I think it's very possible. I think I think it is the I think what we're gonna see is that's alluding to the European world joining with the Arab world in the seventh and eighth kingdoms. So I know this is a lot of information, but anyway, hopefully this is becoming more simple to you. The uh, rise and fall of Babylon, you know, we've got these five phases. Is I won't repeat the five phases, but we do see here how the harlot Babylon, the city of Rome, is related to it. Is, is Once the Antichrist rises up, he's going to bring this woman into the preeminence of the world. He's, the woman's going to ride the beast to global preeminence, and then at, um, at the last half of the tribulation or the beginning of the great tribulation, he's going to destroy the harlot Babylon. Okay. So now the seventh kingdom. So what we're going to do now is for the seventh kingdom is I'm going to show, you know, the, we talked about the 17 goals of sustainable development. I'm going to show two videos for us, or I'm going to show about four videos that I think is going to bring all this to life for us. So I'm going to stop sharing here. Okay, so this is the first video I'm going to show. You, you just one note, you might need to turn your computer speakers up to hear it better. The United Nations General Assembly was the scene of a celebration in 2015 when 193 member countries adopted the Sustainable Development Goals, a unanimous commitment to end poverty, fight inequality, and tackle climate change. We need action from everyone, everywhere. 17 Sustainable Development Goals are our guide. They are a to-do list for people and planet and the blueprint for success. The SDGs are an agenda to balance human prosperity with protecting the planet. Imagine there's no countries. UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador Shakira asked global leaders to imagine a world where we achieve the goals by 2030. While fellow UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador Angelique Kijo underscored a focus on Africa and developing countries. But the universal agenda is important to all nations as leaders from developed countries also pledged to make the goals a reality. Poverty, growing inequality exists in all of our nations, and all of our nations have work to do, and that includes here in the United States. And that's why today I am committing the United States to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. The Sustainable Development Goals build on the success of another 15-year plan. Created in the year 2000, the Millennium Development Goals sunset at the end of 2015. The MDGs halved extreme poverty, achieved equal primary education for girls and boys, and dropped HIV infection by 40% among many successes. The SDGs go beyond the MDGs by improving the lives of everyone everywhere and create a better world for future generations. Today, we are 100 and 93 young people representing billions more. The youngest Nobel Peace Laureate, Malala, calls on world leaders to keep their promise to every child. Each Lenten we hold represents the hope we have for our future because of the commitments you have made to the global goals. And Pope Francis advised world leaders to put humanity and the environment over politics. Los gobernantes han de hacer todo lo posible a fin de que todos puedan tener la mínima base material y espiritual para ejercer su dignidad y para formar y mantener una familia. 193 nations unanimously committed to the sustainable development goals. It is so decided. But the journey starts here. 
Now's the time to take global action for local results and move our people and planet towards a sustainable future. We can be. We must be. The first generation to end extreme poverty. The generation most determined to fight injustice and inequalities. The generation that saves the planet from climate change. And this is how it will get done. The global goals. A 15-year plan for everyone, everywhere. With no one left behind. We, we will live in a world where nobody anywhere lives in extreme poverty. Where no, no one goes hungry. Where no one wakes in the morning asking if there will be food today. We will live in a world where no child has a diet. Diseases we know how to cure. And where proper health care is a lifelong right for us all. We will live in a world where everyone goes to school. And education gives us the knowledge and skills for a fulfilling life. We will live in a world where all girls and all women have equal opportunities to thrive and be powerful and safe. We cannot succeed if half the world is going we will live in a world where all people can get clean water and proper toilets at home, at school, and at work. We will live in a world where there is sustainable energy for everyone. Heat, light, and power for the whole planet. Without destroying the planet. We will live in a world where our economy is prosper. A new wealth leads to decent jobs for everyone. And we will live in a world where our industry our infrastructure and our best innovations are not just used to make money but to all make all our lives, lives better. better. We will live in a world where prejudices and extremes of inequality are defeated inside our countries and between different countries. Where people live in cities and communities that are safe, progressive, and, and support everyone who lives there. Where we replace what we consume, planet where we put back what we take out of the earth. We live in a world that is decisively rolling back the from climate, climate change. Where we restore and protect the, and protect the life in our, our oceans, oceans and seas. We will restore and protect life on land. The forests, animals, the earth itself. With peace between and inside countries. Where all governments are open. And answer to us for what they do at home and abroad. And the justice rules. With everyone equal before the law. Where all countries and we their people work together in partnerships of all kinds to make these goals a reality for everyone, everywhere. These are the United Nations global. La mayor parte de los habitantes del planeta se declaran creyentes. Esto debería provocar un diálogo entre las religiones. No debemos dejar de orar por él y colaborar con quienes piensan distinto. Confío en Buda. Creo en Dios. Creo en Jesucristo. Creo en Dios. Alá. Muchos piensan distinto, sienten distinto, buscan a Dios o encuentran a Dios de diversa manera. En esta multitud, en este abanico de religiones, hay una sola certeza que tenemos para todos. Todos somos hijos de Dios. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Confío en vos para difundir mi petición de este mes. Que el diálogo sincero entre hombres y mujeres de diversas religiones conlleve frutos de paz y justicia. Confío en tu oración. Okay, before I share this video, I want to read, I want to read uh, one scripture. Um, this video to me is the most enlightening of how, if you listen very, very closely to, if you listen very closely to this video, you're going to see that the Pope is pushing, when we're talking about inclusive capitalism, we're talking about a, an entirely different new economy that they want to push. This video was released at the end of 2020. So this is, this is very new. Um, you, what you're gonna see is you're gonna see the Pope pushing this new economic system. You're gonna see also here, um, I'm trying to find, let me, let me find the scripture. Just give me one second. 
um, Revelation 18, verse 23, talks about this, this harlot Babylon, and it says, for your merchants were the great men of the earth. So when you watch this, notice how many, read the titles of everyone you're going to see as you see their video. They're going to be CEOs of banks, of, of major corporations. So you, 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 you really see Revelation 17 and 18. You see, you're going to hear how they want to bring in a one world religion. They're going to want to also tie it into the 17 goals of sustainable development. So pay real close attention to this, because this, this to me, Revelation 17 and 18 can be confusing to understand. But I think this, this video gives an example of the merger of government, religion, and the economic system into one three-quarted strand. So pay attention to that as we watch, watch this video. È necessario urgente un sistema economico giusto, affidabile e in grado di rispondere alle sfide più radicali che l'umanità e il pianeta si trovano ad affrontare. We are answering Pope Francis's challenge to create more inclusive economies that spread the benefit of capitalism more equitably and allow individuals to realize their full potential. A majority of people around the world say that they think their families will be worse off in five years. That's a scenario that we simply can't accept. Too much wealth has accreted to too few people. If you make money, what's the point if you're not prepared to share it? If the people who help make that wealth for you can't live with dignity. It's inclusive capitalism though, and we have to recognize that starting from where we are to where we need to get to. You know, we need to bring everyone as, uh, along and there will be adjustments that come with that. We do need the private sector's ingenuity, capital, technology, people, everything, their passion to come to the party. We want to operate in a sustainable way where incentives are aligned across generations, not just across quarters, and the main actors take a long-term perspective. Aligning our innovation with the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the priorities of inclusive capitalism is both a business and sustainability imperative. Two reasons I think why I'd say concrete commitments uh, to inclusive capitalism matter. I mean, the first and, and not to be underestimated, really important is they can inspire other people. And the second thing that I would say around concrete mm. public, public commitments is they can help build trust. Leaders in the business community can be a unifying force. They can be a, a source of opportunity. They can be a source of understanding. So we as business leaders can step up and solve many of these economic problems. I think business uh, plays a very important role in, re in resolving these challenges. I think businesses have to become you know, part of the solution through leadership uh, by example uh, and through leadership by incentives. We are stewards of this earth. It's our duty to keep it clean and to keep it decent for future generations. I want him to embark on this journey to provide the guidance and the assistance of the churches on social thought and whatever other consideration might be necessary, you know, or the ethical or, you know, just social guidance, so that this group that has you know, taking up such a noble task of making capitalism work for the good of humanity, achieve its goal and land on target. So this is our vision, this is our purpose. Look, the fact that different religions need to come together on all matters is just the crying need of the times in our world. Faith cannot be used to pull us apart. Faith is meant to bring us together. and. The fact that I'm a Sikh and somebody else is a different religion, to me, doesn't matter. Our work is indeed about social justice, which is rooted in the gospel. The idea that every person deserves to live in a just society. 
Capitalism is at the heart of innovation that creates higher standard of living. And we know that it's been working, yet we also know we can do a lot better. We need a new system focused on the well-being of people. It's a big challenge, but if it is done right, the benefits will be immense. It's not just an asset owner. It's not just an asset manager. It's not just a, a CEO. It's not just these boards of directors. We have to work collectively over the long term. What I think capitalism has to stand for to, to be inclusive capitalism, how we help uh, everybody have equal access to the opportunity, have, have, have the economic mobility. The council is a terrific body in which we can assemble a critical mass of companies to join and commit uh, to concrete actions uh, that not only affect and improve the communities in which we live, but affect the world community of which we're all a part of. We believe we need more than a thousand organizations on board and only with this very purposeful collective action we will see the systemic change across markets that will make capitalism truly inclusive. We invite all businesses, large and small, and individuals to join us as stewards for inclusive capitalism by going to our website, agreeing the principles, and making your own commitments to inclusive capitalism. Please join us. Thank you.